Hey you, how's it going? My name is Ruby Price and you are listening to episode 36 of Fresh From The Scene. First things first, if you enjoy today's podcast, I'd love it if you could give it a 5 star rating on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. I'll shout out all of you who do to say thanks. And let's not forget the massive impact that sharing this podcast on social media will have. Remember to tag a friend who you think might also enjoy it. And speaking of social media, if you want to come on this podcast, get in touch. We're on Twitter at FFTScene, that's F-F-T-S-C-E-N-E. Or let me know who you would like me to speak to, and remember to tag them as well. Otherwise, you're just screaming into the void. Well, are you feeling glorious today? Because, and I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but the guest on today's podcast is a bit of a snow queen. And I tell you what. It's no prophecy, but I like it. And that's right, let's get on to this week's guest, Mikey Shiraz from Mr. Shiraz on episode 36 of Fresh From The Scene. You're listening to Fresh From The Scene with your host, Ruby Price. Welcome to Fresh From The Scene. Today's guest is the amazing Mikey Shiraz. Thank you! Amazing, I like that. Amazing is, you know, probably one of the many, um, you know, adjectives that we could use to describe yeah. it. It's the one <laughs> Some I not so good. <laughs> it's the one I settled on. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. It's a, a sunny day, so that's always a bonus. I've been for a nice walk with a dog today, which was good. Had to go to Doncaster, which wasn't so good, but, you know, you take the ups with the downs. And, yeah. But yeah, all in all, all, in a pretty good mood today. That's good. I'm glad we got you on. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm normally in a pretty good mood. Yeah, I so. don't think I've ever really seen you not smiling. <laughs> no, I, I'm a big believer in PMA, positive mental attitude. Yeah, so. <laughs> positive mental attitude. Um, oh, actually, that just reminds me. Like when I was, I've just come back from Gibraltar. Um, I need to show you this. Uh, did you see the monkeys? I actually didn't see a single monkey, but what I did see in a shop was this. Oh my <laughs> god! Positive energy drink. I want Bob Ross ones as well. Um, I wonder if you can order those online. Yeah, completely random. I'll post it on the socials, but yeah, that, yeah. that was fantastic. I saw that and I was Did like, you not buy one then? No, I don't really do energy drinks. Nor do I, but you know, just for a keepsake. Yeah. I've still got I'll like a. Next time. I've got an obsession with like 80s films and stuff like that, and, uh, and Ghostbusters especially. Yeah. And I got the Ghost, Ghostbusters 2 kind of pop, and I must have been, I don't know, like eight, and I've still got it now. Unopened? It's unopened, and I'm never going to drink it because I think I'd die. But. You know, I've got it. I've got yeah. some Bronx beer and stuff and some Deftones beer. And I hate IPAs and shit like that, but I've still got them It's full. nice to just have them, isn't it? It yeah. is, yeah. yeah. Like, I think um, Enter Shikari did a, like, beer a couple of years ago and a couple of other bands I know, like, collaborated with Brewdog and stuff or yeah. Signature Brew. Signature Brew is yeah. a big one, yeah, yeah, at the moment. Particularly with Slam Dunk and stuff. Yeah, like, a, a few of my friends' bands have done, like, Signature Brew things, like, uh, they had a Skints did one and yeah. stuff like that. I think I'm just going to buy uh, some stickers and some cans of Carling or something. <laughs> Put Mr. Shiraz on. Well, we should do a wine, really. <laughs> Ooh, that'd be a good one. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shiraz. Um, anyway, uh, I usually start these off with the question. So, in your own words, how would you describe Mr. Shiraz, obviously the band, mm-hmm. um, not just yourself, yeah. <laughs> um, but to someone who's never heard of you? Ooh, right. Mr. Shiraz, uh, a highly bodacious... <laughs> um, Punk rock and roll band who like big riffs, bigger hooks, good times, cheap beer. <laughs> it's hyperactive music for hyperactive people. Yeah. I mean, I saw some uh, videos and photos from the gig, which we'll talk about later, yeah. but they looked hyperactive, so um, it's it, a certainly accurate description. Yeah, the atmosphere was just off the hook. It was cool. It was really yeah. cool. It's exactly what I wanted. Yeah, but um, who are Mr. Shiraz then? Well, Mr. Shiraz are myself, Mikey Shiraz. Tim Shiraz, Tori Shiraz, Ian Shiraz and Steve Shiraz. We all have the last name, although we're not related. It's very strange. Oh. But, it's, uh, no, but since we started, um, Tori and I were the only original members, but Tim's been in us for about 17 years, because we've been going forever. 
all, uh, all the members who have ever been in have always had to have the, the last name Shiraz. It's like kind of like Ramon's thing. I think it gives us a, a family feel, like camaraderie. And the Ramones did it, and the Ramones are the coolest band ever, so <laughs> if they do it, then it's good enough for us. But yeah, we're just a bunch of friends who like to play music together, get sweaty, and have a good time together. Yeah, I mean, that's what you want, really. Yeah. yeah especially when you've been going, what, seven? Well, it would have been over 17 years, wouldn't it? Oh, it's it? been well over. Yeah, yeah. it's been uh, 22 years. 22 years. We did start as an eight-piece ska punk band, you know, like <laughs> Real Big Fish sort of thing, and we're, we're quite a long way away from that now. Like, we haven't done that sort of music in maybe 15 years, and then we went to this weird stage in the middle. But I'd say with this, but if it's like how I see Mr. Shiraz and what our sound is and because I think it took us a long time to find our sound so I say we've been going seven years as yeah. the Mr. Shiraz which definitive I, edition yes yeah the, the the Mr. Shiraz I've always wanted it to be yeah 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 so like obviously you know you mentioned it's been going that long and things have sort of changed but like how has like the way the band sort of works changed through that time period. You know, it's not changed that much. <laughs> it's it's always had a, a very similar dynamic, and I, I, it is always been about a fun time and this uh, sort of like the band and the audience meeting as one. You know, if there's one person in the crowd or twenty thousand, know, we don't give a shit. It's a I think if you see us playing, you can tell that we really enjoy it, like really, really, really enjoy it, and, and that's why we do it. And it's always been like that. I've always said, if you're not looking forward to a gig, if you're not really excited about it, then what is the actual yeah. point? It shouldn't be a... Why are you doing it? It, it should it's... never be a chore. I mean, we all have shitty days, but how many people in the world get to go... Oh, what are you doing tonight? I'm going to go on stage and jump around with my friends with some music playing that we wrote together to some people and we'll have some drinks. We've never been a band who has taken ourselves too seriously. And I think that's uh, helped us in the long way. In the long run, should I say. Yeah, it's like uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We are very serious about what we do. You know, we'd, we'd never want to do a, a shitty show. We practice, we write what we truly believe of fucking great songs but we're never gonna take it serious yeah but, well too serious <laughs> yeah i mean that's always seems to be a good approach to take i mean you know like you say if you're not enjoying it why are you bothering it exactly i've seen people who beat themselves up about stuff and i'm like why yeah why it's like oh well, it's like you know we're playing this sort of music it doesn't mean you have to be you know shit <laughs> yeah. a shit person or like or like bring people down I think the worst thing I, I can I, I can see at a gig is you see a band come off stage and you'll see a fan go up to that band and go what an amazing show and then that person turn around to the, to the person who just said that to them and go now nah, we were shit it's like why say that say thank you yeah. take the compliment they've really enjoyed it and at the end of the day you want them to be happy and if they've had a great time then you've done well good yeah. work you yeah. yeah, and then as well, like you know, what they're gonna remember then is you saying that you thought you were shit. Exactly, it's like what well, they think they're shit. Then why should I like them? Yeah. And yeah. then you start questioning, like whether you know, like you can accurately say whether someone was good. Or yeah, not. yeah, yeah. It's like you know, it's a. Uh, you can always say if you're a band, yeah, it's your band, but it also belongs to everybody else as well because yeah. you're throwing it out there. You're giving it out, so if you're giving it out, it belongs a bit to them too. Like I've had people. Ah, well, well, sorry, I just remembered something that happened years and years ago. We were playing at Leeds Festival, and uh, we used to have a dancer in the band because that was his whole job in the band. He was a good friend, and it was me and him came up with the idea of doing a band. He was meant to be a guitarist, and we worked out he couldn't play guitar. But we were playing Leeds Festival, and we had such a fun time. And we weren't the best band in the world there, but it was like we had a lot of hyper energy and. For, that like really catapulted us up and we, we got really popular yeah. and um, I was walking around and like people were being really nice going oh I saw you play last night you were amazing I'm like thank you thank you and Chris and Zell dance he's like oh you're all this is exactly what he sounds like he's like oh people are always coming out to you I was like yeah cool right and then we were watching I can't remember who and two kids must have been about 14 walked up to Chris and were like were you in that Mr. Shiraz band who played yesterday and he, he this smug look came over his face. He was like, 
Yeah, yes, I was. And they were, you were so shit. You were so shit. And I just started laughing my head off, and he just looked devastated. And what a good time that was. <laughs> oh, man, that's amazing. Um, yeah, so obviously Record Glorious just came out. Yes, it did. Yep, it's got a fantastic cover art. If you it haven't does. seen it, I suggest people look at it. It's us as dogs. <laughs> we're all big dog fans. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you don't like dogs, you can't be trusted. That is a good... Um, I think it's more if dogs don't like you as well. That is very true. Yeah. It is very true. If a dog or a cat doesn't like you, you start thinking... No, I think with a cat, that's fine, because cats don't like everybody. Cats are a bit more aloof. You know, there's, somebody said to me once, this saying as I go in, the difference between a dog and a cat is, if you're there at home and you're putting up a shelf, a dog will look at you and go... <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, but God damn it, I love you. Whereas a cat look at you and just go, it's not going to stay up that. You know, and I think that's it. I mean, I, I like cats. I do. I used to have a cat called Tiger who was, he hated everybody, but he loved yeah. me and he used to just always lie on me. But dogs, I've always had dogs as well. Dogs are just wonderful, aren't they? Dogs are wonderful. And I don't, I'm going to touch wood here because <laughs> I've never met a dog that hasn't got on with me either. Yeah. So, yeah people, I've had people go, my dog, it doesn't like people in hats, or it doesn't like men, or it doesn't like uh, doesn't like people or anything. And then I'll go, oh, let me just meet it. It's going to bark at you. And I'll be like, hello. And it's just running <laughs> straight up and not bark to me. So I'm a dog whisperer. Yeah. Good old dogs. But yes, yeah, so our album covers yeah. us as dogs. Yeah, and speaking of dogs as well, first song on it's called Labrador, which has a fantastic music video. Yes, um, it does. <laughs> 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 what? Well, What's the, that's, it was made with a software, I can't remember what it's called. It's the software that, that my friend Callum has. Yeah. And like, um, as most things do start out, we were in a pub <laughs> and we were a bit drunk and we were talking about Labrador and these stupid ideas I had for a video. And he was like, good. I've got this face mapping software. Do you want to come around like next Saturday? So we were both hung over at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning in his little studio bedroom in, in his house and just doing it there and I brought my dog masks with me because I've got some dog yeah. masks like because you know who doesn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he was like yeah just good fun <laughs> I mean watching it was good fun and gave me a right laugh mm-hmm. yeah it's like I mean that song um, it started with, with the title it was like Labrador was just something that made us <laughs> all really laugh because you know Labrador hardcore bring it together Labrador and then when I was writing the lyrics it was just like it's it's about a boy who's a dog. And when we were recording, we recorded the album with uh, Andy Hawkins, who's a great producer. He's done a lot of great albums, like uh, for Pigeon Detectives, Kaiser Chiefs, everything like that. And we were in, we are doing them, and uh, I was singing the song, and he was like, stop the song. He was like, Mike, what is this song about? <laughs> I was thinking, it's about a guy who's trying to explain to his partner that he's a dog. So he's going, that's ridiculous. I was like, I know. He's like, can you bring the lyrics in? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I took the lyrics in. And I was just recording. I could see him through the window and at all times. He was just shaking his head. And then he stopped. He was like, that's the most idiotic song I've ever heard in my life. I was like, do you like it? He's going, yeah, I really like it, but it's just, <laughs> it's idiotic. And then when he came back and asking if there's anything you want, want to change on the album, I was like going, can we stick? a werewolf howl at the start of that song I and mean, one word that reply came back being ridiculous but he did it <laughs> so yeah I'm really happy with that song <laughs> yeah I mean tell me more about um, recording the album then like was it all done with well we had this uh, great idea um, in the before times the before, before times. the before the pandemic uh, we'd used Andy before to record our last EP Mountains of Kong and we were just blown away by the studio, which is the Nave in Pudsey, which is one of the most beautiful studios you'll ever see. And also the sound that uh, he got out of us. We've always had this thing like, um, I don't want to sound big headed, but I will. But, uh, we've always sound, been known as being ridiculously good live. You know, you come to a gig, you'll really enjoy it. But we've never been able to get it onto record. And that's nothing to do with the producers. Mm. It's just we're a lot of hyper people with a lot of different ideas. We all listen to different sorts of music. So it'd just go like, and it'd just be 
it'd come back and just be, sound a bit too flat for yeah, what we it's are. It's always hard to capture that in a studio. It really is. Uh, but Andy seemed to get it. So we'd release, a, I think, three EPs in a row. And then we're like, we should really do an album. We've got a lot of great songs. So we got in touch with Andy and we booked him for uh, three weeks at the studio all together. And, we, and then uh, the day that Ian went in to start tracking the drums was the day that the lockdown started. March 15th, so we were just like, I think. Oh, look at you. Is it, is it, is it, <laughs> yeah, so it was just like, oh shit, well, I guess that's that. But then Andy got in touch and he's like, going, there is a way we can do it. It's not really the way that it was. So what we'll do is... Ian will come in for three days, we'll do all social distancing, stay away from each other, because Andy's got a, a kid and stuff, so of course he doesn't want to bring yeah. it on to his family. So yeah. he did his drums, and a couple of weeks later, Tori went in and did her basses, and she did that, and I think, we were trying to do like a, I think she, she had like five days to it, but Tori's an absolute freak at how good she is at bass, and she did it in like two. And then we just did it like that, and then uh, about six months down the line, it was my turn to go in do the vocals and it was a weird way of doing it because normally if you're all there together and you don't like something you can go that sounds shit yeah and they tell me it sounds shit it does it again from me <laughs> but um, so it, it was weird like that but it kind of also works because we didn't have we weren't in each of those ears throwing all the, these ideas and it gave people I guess a chance to breathe and try to stuff yeah. out and Andy's he's a smart man he's, he's produced a lot of big songs and a lot of big albums and he knows what's going to sound right so he was very much like don't do that try it like this do this make me a cup of tea you've never seen somebody who drinks so much tea oh, I've is... seen them I've looked in the mirror <laughs> oh no, no honestly this is insane he always has a giant sports direct mug and he must have 15 20 cups a day and you're in the studio at, say 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. and he'll just be and I don't drink tea. I don't yeah. drink hot drinks at all. Um, but I, it just amazes me. So, like, you'll finish a thing going, how's that? You'll sit down and go, my cup's a bit empty, so you have to get my cup of tea. But he, how his mind works, he knows. He, he knew straight away what we were, like, going for. Yeah. And he was, like, real enough bands going, so do you like these? I was like, oh, yeah, I love these, I love these. And he'd say, like, yeah, maybe on this riff here, short on it, make it longer, maybe double up that chorus. And just a lot of good ideas. And, so it was, it was a real, as weird as it was, it was a, a lot of fun to do. Uh, I got a lot of joy doing this album, which is strange because I hate being in the studio. I, I find it nerve-wracking and dull. But I had a really good time, which was good. Yeah, I mean, it's always good as well when like the um, producer or you know just engineer and stuff can like make you feel comfortable, calm, and like get the best out of you. Yeah. Because that's where it's going to happen. Yeah, I mean... You don't see him smile or laugh. He's a very serious man. So you just don't know. You don't know. Like, like I've done okay. Like, I remember the first time on this when he said, uh, yeah, you did a really good song uh, on that track. And So I was like, oh, thanks, Dad. Just like joking. He's like, no, I'm, I'm give you a compliment. I'm going, I'm sorry, I just didn't know how to take it. Because it, just, <laughs> it felt really nice. And uh, a weird story with this now. Um, we were playing a few months ago with... Um, Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons, you know, Phil Campbell from Motorhead. Yeah. And we got off this gig going, do you want to do main sports? So we're like, yeah, of course we do. And two days before, Tori is basically, she got COVID. So we're like, shit, what do we do? Because she's got really intricate bass lines. Like, uh, she's incredible at bass. Like, you know, plectrum, it's not just root notes. It's like, mm. she plays the whole bass. Um, so we didn't know what to do. And like, I was like, well, we've got us friends who are bassists, but... We've had them standing before and we've had to cut down the sets and go down. We've got two days. And then Tim was a guitarist. He was like, I'm going to ask Andy. So he asked Andy, going, because he's a very good musician. He was just like, yeah, I'll do it. Send me the set. So we sent him the set and the songs that he hadn't recorded we were playing. So and he's there going, cool, cool. We're going, well, we're doing a practice here. And he's like, I'm too busy in the studio. Uh, once a gig. So we're like, it's in two days. He goes, cool. What time sound check? Like five o'clock. He was like, can't make it for that time. What time are you on stage? What, nine o'clock. He was like, I'll be there at quarter to nine. So he arrived at quarter to nine. He hadn't practiced with us. He hadn't sound checked with us. He walked on stage. And this man who was so stern in the studio, we were like, what's he going to be like? Will he be any good? 
the second the, the first drum hit, went fucking nuts, <laughs> played everything perfect. We finished a set, and he sort of went, I've got to get off now, I've got another gig to play, and left. <laughs> so he was there for all 50 minutes of the evening, just played a stunning set and left, and was just like, well, that worked out really yeah. good. So, But he... he Sent a message next day saying he had a great time and he'd like to, uh, if it ever happens again on guitar or bass and give him a shout. So we're like, yeah. sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've been lucky with that. Uh, we just did a, a tour with uh, Jay the Cat and Carl from Jay the Cat used to be in Shiraz. Yeah. And uh, so Tim couldn't play for a couple of shows and so I sent Carl songs and it, so he just did double duty and played for us for a few of the dates. And my other mate, Sam Wood, he's in like Wayward Sons and stuff. He's, uh, he's played with us a couple of times when Tim hasn't been able to. He's fucking Tim, man. It's always Tim. You can never <laughs> do gigs. Idiot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, when I was listening to the record, like, there's obviously elements of, like, naughty rock and stuff. I got some feeder vibes as well and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, and to be honest, I feel like it wouldn't be out of place on, like, a Tony Hawk soundtrack. Really. Totally. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, yeah, like, what were the kind of bands that were, like, inspiring the music behind this? Uh, we are all hard into the 90s you know this is uh, where we grew up you know so we are we are all big fans of like just that whole alt rock lollop a loser sort of time like things like Fifth No More Nirvana of course N.W.A. even you know, Rage and then um, also you know Skate Punk you know the, the Fat Wreck bands the old Epitaph bands before the label got shit <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, things like you know, bouncing souls and stuff, and the Bronx, and just um, punk rock is a big thing in. Well, especially like it's what I listen to is a lot of American punk rock. Mm. Uh, but yeah, like I said, we've all got different things which we listen to. Um, Ian, uh, he doesn't come across in the album, but he likes like things like Dillinger Escape Plan, Every Time I Die, like math rock. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, he's like, luckily him and Steve as other guitarists have got another band where they can do all these crazy six, eight, fifty-four beats. And I, I'm like, and where they're going, no, four, four, we're playing punk rock, man, you know. We're, we're going to do first, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, double chorus, riffs. That's all we want, man. We don't want this thing. It's not thinking music. It's, it's anthemic music. <laughs> it's music to skip for... Kids in the north is to skateboard to. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just things like that. It's like, yeah, my two favourite bands are the Bronx Fifth No More. And then, yeah, Tim, he gets into some weird shit. He'll tell what he's been listening to. When he'll come to practice, he'll go, I've got an idea for a song. And like, he'll start playing something like going, is that the Charlatans? So, yeah, I've been listening to the Charlatans. <laughs> like but I, I think it helps us because uh, we try not to pigeonhole ourselves too much. A lot of us old albums were very schizophrenic, like you'd go from a ska song to a full blown metal song. But I think this is the most rounded album where it's got yeah. definitely a sound and stuff like that. There's no like. We did go in going, I, I want a song, uh, an album of hooks. That's what I want to do this time, just hooks. I'm going to try and write the best choruses I've ever written to these stuff. And like, they're all great musicians, and luckily they came up with this amazing music where I was like I can write a chorus to every one of these songs <laughs> one of the songs is like 40 no 37 seconds long but I was like I can still make a song out of this uh, you know <laughs> yeah I mean it certainly comes across that way you know mm. like definite hooks definite earworms um, yeah yeah it's what you want yeah big time yeah uh, so we obviously mentioned it a little bit the release show at Paris yes uh Sadly, I was at another release show in a different country. In the country um, of monkeys, Gibraltar. Yes. Um, but, you know, how was that, like, other than hyperactive? It was just great fun. Um, I got on two of my favourite Huddersfield bands in Split Lips, who were a brand new band. I think they've only done, like, three or four gigs. But um, I just really like them. They've got, uh, they feel like a, they've got a kind of a black flag vibe going with them. But uh, like it's, it's, it's like it's got some good riffs. It's got good hardcore in there. Um, they, they seem to be having a great time. Since they haven't done many gigs, they already feel like a unit, which mm. I thought was really good. So I wanted to put them on to like try and give them like a a fun show to play and like uh, you know 
be free, my yeah. be free, my my puppies. <laughs> yeah, go out to the world and uh, and then Carol Hodgeband, like uh, I've known Carol for years because I mean she's in Crass and uh, Ryan Hamilton. She's in like loads of big bands and she's a great soul performer. And she's just put together this awesome band uh, of musicians and just to get them on because I really like them. She like her songwriting is phenomenal she's one of her songs is one of my, some of my favorite lyrics i've heard in years so i was like well we'll get her on as well and then like the crowd i never know what to think what's going to happen yeah it's, it's a hometown and stuff and so we, we always hope people will come but i always get nervous as shit that people were but it was a killer night like there was a lot of people here people were crawling on each other which is always nice <laughs> everyone was having fun some people brought tequilas to the stage. Like people had travelled from like London, Nottingham, and everything. So it, that made me feel really nice, you know. Yeah. And it was just a really good, fun night. Like uh, because especially when all your friends are here and they're all giving me those cheesy grins. My big brother was here with his wife, and I was laughing a lot because he was just really pissed and dumps in the <laughs> crowd. But well, that's wonderful to see because when we first started, he was our manager. Like he sorted out our first European tours and shit, but he hasn't done that for a long time. So to have him here and everything was just killer. And knowing that people there, uh, seeing people would it, the album would come out at midnight that day, that morning or whatever, and uh, people already knew the words, which was nice. Which was good to see after all the work we'd put into it and how long we'd been sat on it, and see that people had already seen that. And we also got a, a good notice from his uh, label. Like I got up at half eight in the morning to take the dog out I was like it's been eight out eight and a half hours let's have a look at the artist dashboard and on Spotify it already had 18,000 players so it's like ha ha shit yeah <laughs> that's cool as fuck <laughs> yeah and you hadn't just left it on overnight no either. no no because I'd fallen asleep uh, before it even come out because I'm worried and I was tired I was watching Grey's Anatomy uh-huh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like obviously, um, you yourself obviously have a great relationship with Parish. Like, was it always the intention to have the launch here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, I mean, if we were still at the old place, it would have been there. It's uh, because it's Huddersfield for a start, yeah. which is you know where we are from. And I can't imagine doing it anywhere else. And since we've moved here, we've got this new stage, the new lighting, the new sound system. I want to use it as much as possible. And also, I won't charge myself a higher fee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, um, 10 grand for us yeah. to play the package. Yeah. What's my guarantee? <laughs> can we have a rider? What can we have in this rider? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, Tori gets pissed off sometimes because um, we'll play a gig and the rider will be there and it'll just be like, lager and water, some snacks. And she's like, she doesn't like lager. She likes gin, she likes wine. Ian likes fruity ciders, so it's like, well, on our rides there, we've got some wine and food to stay in Zambia. <laughs> so everyone's happy. <laughs> Does anybody want water? No, we'll forget that. <laughs> Push that off the side. I'm like, the chefs will cook for you. So it's just, you know. I've got to say, I, it's because I think I really like the parish promoter. He's a nice guy. He treats us well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we, we would have always done it here. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Yeah. And it's like, I'd like to say, it, I can go downstairs afterwards and get a cheap drink. <laughs> like, have you been to the Underworld in Camden? Uh, I haven't yet. It's one of my favourite venues like, to go to and to play. And we've got a thing, before we go on stage, we all like to have a shot together. And when we come off stage, we'll have a, a shot or a bomb together. And we were playing there, and like, I was like, ah, I'll get the shots tonight. So I was like, five tequilas. And they were like, okay, 25 pounds. I was like, well, you fucking what? <laughs> Holy shit, we're only getting 75 for playing. <laughs> so, so it's like that, but so down here, you know, it's, I know I can get bombs for everyone, and they won't break the bank. Yeah. And we always like to say, you were here, so you, you don't know. Have you ever seen this? Uh, no. Which oh, my God. <laughs> what is this sham interview? <laughs> um, we always like to try and claim it's his, um, it's his birthday, so people buy his drinks. Because uh, then they feel bad that we're, yeah. we've come out of our house and come away from our <laughs> friends to play for these scumbags in the crowd <laughs> so yeah we, we always try and get people to buy us drinks once it was my actual birthday at the Brudenell and I said look it truly is my birthday and I, was, I said that in the second song and as the set was going on more and more drinks were just <laughs> appearing and I got more and more drunk and as driver was 
he couldn't make the show because he had to go somewhere else but they were like I'll pick you up what time does it all end I was like headliner finishes at 11 so he got there at half 10 and watched a bit of the headliner and I don't remember any of this because <laughs> we were out with his buddy's random hand and Tilson the bassist me and him were just there and he had a bottle of Jack and he was pouring it in my mouth and I was pouring it in his mouth and <laughs> supposedly uh, they finally got me out of the building and into the van at half one in the morning <laughs> and he was pissed off and he said all the way home you were just talking and talking non-stop and like the next morning I woke up with a horrible hangover I came downstairs in my house and all the band's gear was there and I was like why is the band gear here I was like because you were claiming the practice room was locked and you've made everyone go uh, drop got them to drop everyone at home and you last and you just took it all into the house yourself and left it there going, I need to get rid of it before Charlotte gets back from my sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, I don't even know where I was with that. What was the question? <laughs> uh, there wasn't one, actually. Ah, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, that was just, um, you asked me a question. Oh, uh, yeah, about, the, about Underworld. Because yeah, there's a lot of great venues. There's like uh, a few London ones were always on my bucket list, and we've got to play a few of them, like the Underworld yeah. and... Is it an academy? A story before it closed oh, down. Yeah. Like the fact that we got we played a story or two one night, and I remember uh, we'd finished the set. And it was a killer set. It was like a huge crowd, and we got to the exit to like look at this van, and we opened the doors, and there were thousands <laughs> of people there, and everyone kind of screamed, like cheered, and looked at us and stopped cheering, and uh, Bowling for Soup were playing in the story one the same night. We, we thought it was going to be them walking out, so. Uh, please tell me you told them that story when they were here. Totally forgot, but those guys can drink. Yeah, I, I sat up here <laughs> until four in the morning with them. Like uh, they were saying the night before, the uh, tour manager and the singer had drank what was it, twelve bottles of red wine between them. And that night he had they just drank. Yeah, so I mean much the alcohol. amount of delicious Garys that came out on stage during the show. I know. It was, I tried one of those after the show. Did you enjoy? They were really nice. And they, they were such an easy bunch to work with as well. We had a, a lovely time. Yeah. And like, uh, especially their manager, me and him, got on like a house on fire. He sent me a lovely message the next day, going, "Let's hang out in the future. We're over in December, so choose a date and let's go get drunk." So I'm like, "Well, yeah. sounds dangerous, but I'm down." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I knew Rob when he was in Pay and Pending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was lovely then, so like, you know, now that he's with another bunch of lovely lads, I'm like, what could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you something about Pitt and Pending. I used to uh, write for a few uh, music magazines and stuff like that. And one of the albums I got sent was a Pitt and Pending one. And I gave it a terrible review. I can't remember. Right. I gave it like one out of five and said something about it being so sickly it could give you diabetes. I feel bad now. I must have been having a bad day or something. I just not really not enjoyed it. I just, I just, but then, uh, yeah, when I was talking to him, I was like, oh, wow. Because he was mentioning yeah. Peyton Pendon. I was thinking, I gave them a terrible review once. I think it's because the editor was being shitty with me. and Because she, she used to always be shitty because I, I was always late on my deadlines. Yeah. Because I had other things to do, like stroke the dog <laughs> or you know <laughs> I was like where's, where's these reviews it should have been at 10 it's 12 now I'm going well stop it I've been busy <laughs> <sighs> this yeah. band's going to feel my wrath now <laughs> for the record is this something you want me to take out nah don't take anything out nah, nah. <laughs> I don't care <laughs> I do, nah yeah no nah, you stay very I mean yeah, everyone gets bad reviews yeah who does I love uh, I love it when we get a bad review. I sometimes try and find a terrible review. You know, when you put your quotes on the posters, yeah. just add a line from that really bad review. Yeah. Going, Worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> well, we're keeping that. That is fantastic. I mean, to be fair, that's, if that's on a poster, that's more likely to get people in as well. I mean, you know, is, uh, when we first started, I used to take reviews to heart. I used to get really, really upset. Uh, there was a, a guy who used to write for <clears throat> some punk website. And we'd only been going about a year and a bit. And he told me one night on a, a night out at a venue in Leeds how shit we were. <clears throat> and my heart was just breaking in two. I was just like, oh, we, we'd been booked on the gig. And he saw where we were on the bill. He's like, you're on there on the bill? Going, yeah. He's going, that's disgusting. I was like, why is that disgusting? He's like, those bands are so much better than you. I was like, but I think it's just because we, we were more popular. And, but I was like really upset. And it took me a while to get... Thinking my skin, it's just one person's opinion. And yeah. 
Who cares? There's loads of bands I don't like, you know. I've never told them to the face because I'm not a scumbag like that <laughs> yeah. dude. But actually, me and him became, later on in years, we became really good friends. And then uh, he got fired from his job in a different venue, so fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what's next for Mr. Shiraz? Like, tour show? Yeah, we want to get out and uh, do some more touring and stuff like that. Uh, see what's coming up. Um, basically, as we always do, just uh, bands that we've played with in the past, are who we, know going, we see they've got some big tours coming up going, can we please do this <laughs> tour with you? Hey, man. Yeah, just try play gigs, have a good time. Tim's already wanting to record another EP because he, he just likes writing for some stupid reason the worst yeah. part about being in a band has been in the practice room not because of them I like them but you know it's just like I want to play gigs yeah but yeah lots of gigging I'm um, just designing some new t-shirts at the moment as well because we're running along those it's got a dog on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and yeah just keep on keeping on um, we're trying to push it this one really hard I know quite a few magazines have, uh, have said it's in their ne- next issue I'm going to do a few features we yeah. always do because it always helps you a lot. I've had this thing that's just terrified me, but also kind of cool. For like one of the magazines, uh, the editor got a hold of me saying, you know, really enjoying your album. We're going to do a, a piece in the next issue about you guys and a review of the album. It was like wicked, but in my head, I'm still thinking, you know, our Kerrang band, and this was from Classic Rock magazine. So it's like, are we Classic Rock? Is that <laughs> yeah. what we are now? You know, like it, when you look at your stats of who listens to your album, and I see like the, the ages, yeah. as I go in, under 18s, it's like 1%. <laughs> we found our age range. 35 now. to 49. It's, uh, I'll tell you exactly what it is, because <laughs> I've got it, always got it somewhere close by. <laughs> yeah, I look at my YouTube statistics a lot, and like it always surprises me, like considering my age, how old sometimes like the majority of my yeah. audience can be. Under 18 is 0%. 18 to 22, 6% of listeners. 23 to 27, 13% of listeners. Mm. 28 to 24, uh, sorry, 28 to 34 is 24% of his listeners. 35 to 44 is 36%. 45 to 59 is 20%. <laughs> and 60 plus is 1%. So I'm like, yeah, I guess we're a classic rock band now. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, um, have you seen the meme that's, uh, now this is what I call dad rock and it's got things like fat lip yeah and, yeah uh, MGMT and stuff and you're like yeah it's disgusting I still call that new music you know I'm still at the point where it's like where people I went to see Mike Kim a few weeks ago Same. and in my head I'm just still seeing those as like when it came out going this isn't punk rock <laughs> this isn't rancid and no effects but it's not Pennywise what is this new shit and then I see they've broken up and come back and everything and and like when we were at the gig, I was like looking around, going, "Everybody here is middle aged." Yeah. And uh, it's it was just freaky because I'm there going, "Yeah, these, these to me like they're a new band." Yeah. <laughs> but you see, like uh, we've done quite a few gigs over the last few years with um, Ugly Kid Joe, and when I was like 14, I used to think they were the best band in the world, mm. and we've become like to become friends with them now, and we keep getting like gigs with them. It's just and their crowd. Going down so well with the crowd. Like we did a, a gig with a solo gig in <clears throat> at the Waterloo in Blackpool the other month, and you looked at the crowd and like the average age was about fifty, but uh, they bought a lot of t-shirts and everyone had uh, was great. So I was like, going, well, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. <laughs> I mean, you can either embrace it or you can like, you know, try and deny it as much. Oh, as I'm you never going to embrace it, but I'll accept it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so to round this off, I'm going to do a quick fire round, which is Ooh. something how I've like been ending these. A lot. Is it like word association? Um, not quite. Okay, cool. Um, it's for the most part A or B, um, and there's two like a bit more open ended ones at the end. I hear. You. Um, but yeah, I'll just get started. So streaming or physical music? Uh, personally, physical. Although I do stream most of the time. Yeah. yeah, I've got Alexa's all over my house and it's just so easy, but I do prefer owning a physical, like, at the moment I like to go to Vinyl Tap and buy records. Yeah. Like the new Turnstile album, I went and got that, yeah. you know, the new Bronx one, I made sure I, I bought that on CD, vinyl and download because I'm 
Starbucks yeah. list. Yeah. I think I've got something like seven copies, including one digital version of an As It Is record. Yeah. <laughs> Just because... I like buying physical no, versions. And there's them. nothing wrong with that. It's like I've got quite a few like Bounce and Souls ones where I'll just find stupid rarities on yeah. eBay and go, well, I'm not going to take it out of its packaging. Yeah. I own it. Yeah, exactly. So. Like they can't then all of a sudden just pull it from your record. Exactly. Collection. And you know, Spotify don't pay me well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, MIDI instruments or real instruments? Real. Yeah. Uh, intimate or stadium gigs? Both. Do you mean playing or uh, going attending? To... Both. I, I had such a good time at Green Day the other week and a, a good time at My Chemical Romance, but I do also love being in a shitty, nasty, smelly, Sweaty. sticky venue <laughs> where you can feel the person in the back. You can smell them. You know, I, yes, above. I, I, I just fucking love gigs. Yeah. <laughs> going to them and playing them is just the best. Yeah. Uh, Reading or Leeds? Festival. Uh, I've never been to Reading, so uh, Leeds. Leeds. Yeah. Leeds, Leeds. Uh, bedroom or studio, studio? Studio, studio. studio I mean, just uh, a lot of uh, producers who uh, <laughs> do it in the bedroom now. I know some really good ones, yeah. but there's a lot of people who go, oh, yeah, I'm a producer. And then you hear the shit, you go, yeah. <laughs> you ain't no producer, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got Garage Band, and I made something that sounded shit, but it, it was passable. Yeah. I am not a producer. I have no natural rhythm for a start, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But, yeah, definitely studio, studio. Do it right. Yeah. Song on repeat at the minute. Can I have a quick look? Yeah. Because it, it, it changes all the time. There's I mean, a, I should hope it changes all the time. Yeah, but it's like, uh, I say that, but I'm still listening to, uh, do you know Counting Crows? Yeah. Are accidentally in love. Why wouldn't I know that? <laughs> Not that. Not that. You know, yeah. like, the pure... <laughs> like, August and Everything After, I think, is one of the greatest albums of all time. And I heard it the year it came out, and I've been. I still listen to that constantly. Like, uh, what am I listening to a lot of the moment? <laughs> oh, I'm on Coin, Co- Coin Toss Girl again, uh, mm-hmm. which is Bouncing Souls. Um, which is just a great song. I, I love the Bouncing Souls. They all you. Like, uh, the other month, the new Bronx album came out, so it was super bloomed by the Bronx. Sometimes I sing for a meatloaf band, so every so often I've got meatloaf on rotation, and they're all fantastic songs. But yeah, it changed a lot. Um, I uh, I do a lot of art, so I've got my little, where I sit and do it, and I got into this thing where I got really late to the party with this one band, and they've been around a long time, but it's only in the last two years I kind of started obsessing and playing them a lot, which is Fleetwood Mac. Oh, yeah. I just, they just always passed me by, I knew like, go your own way and stuff but then I was like I was drunk at my brother's how old are you I know he says I was drunk <laughs> and you know their song Tusk yes which is just fueled by cocaine and I heard that I was like this is just fantastic and then so I was like I'll listen, listen to a bit more and then I was just getting caught into these lyrics and just going this is beautiful music <laughs> so yeah uh, but that's probably going to change tomorrow uh, it'll I just saw the Lemonheads have been announced for Brunel, so I'll probably go on a Lemonheads kick tomorrow or something yeah. like that, and then it'll be Faith No More next week or something. Yeah. Uh, similarly, album of 2022 so far. The Bronx and mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Glorious by Mr. Shiraz and... Oh, Turnstiles! Holy shit, that album. Bronx, Turnstile, Mr. Shiraz. Yeah. Those three. They're the best three albums. Oh, did the Bronx come out last year? I think it came out this year. I think we are year. in July now. Turnstile, yeah, it came out in the last year, didn't it? Did it? That's fine. Yeah, it did. Whilst I've still got you here, is there anything you want to plug? Like, where can people find you, and how can they get a hold of of it? You can find me. Can they get a hold of Glorious? Like, actually get a hold of it? Yeah, we've got physical copies. I've got, I've got to order another set actually because I sold out pretty quick. I don't (laughs) don't know if you know, kind of a big deal. But yeah, you could uh, go to our big cartel or our band camp. Uh, I think it's in Vinyl Tap. Um, just contact us, come to a gig. Come to a gig, that's the best thing. Uh, yeah, download it or stream it in all digital platforms. If you need any artwork doing, get in touch with me because uh, that's my side hustle. I do really good dog portraits and cat portraits. <laughs> or anything anybody wants. You yeah. want anything like riding a unicorn, I'll do it. Uh, yeah. Come to gigs at the parish because there's a lot of really good gigs coming up. 
I and, uh, <laughs> and I need to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> and have a lovely summer, everybody. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Good times. <laughs> Good times. You're listening to Fresh From The Scene with Ruby Price. Thank you very much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please consider taking five minutes or less to leave a review and give this podcast a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at FFT Scene, that's F-F-T-S-C-E-N-E, or you can find me on the socials at Rubes, that's R-U-U-B-E-Z, or on Instagram, Rubes001. With any luck, I'll be back next week with another guest, but until then, I've been Ruby Price, and this was Fresh From The Scene. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>